everybody. So we have another talk this week, again, quite special and spectacular, uh, because our guest is Paul Ewald. Um, Paul actually is one of the founders of the field of evolutionary medicine. Um, his book in 1994 on evolution and infectious disease was a huge inspiration to George and me. I'm not sure we would have written, really written our book except for uh, trying to follow Paul's ideas. He was in the Society of Fellows at University of Michigan back in 1982 and 1983 and had a couple of years to get his work really going. And I met him then and we began talking about how evolution was likely to be uh, useful for evolution medicine. I remember we had lunch one time just when you were leaving town, um, heading off up at a greasy hamburger restaurant before we knew anything <laughs> about diet and health and, and the like. Um, but Paul has been an inspiration for another reason. I mean, just after I'd written the book with George Williams, I was still skeptical. I mean, nobody was buying it and nobody was very interested and I, I didn't know what we'd done. And the people in infectious disease at the University of Michigan, like 30 of them, invited me to talk to them about evolution medicine. So I quick finished Paul's book and I went and talked to them as a junior psychiatrist and they were all wondering, what the heck is a psychiatrist doing talking to us in infectious disease? And all I did is try to explain to them that virulence is a trait that is shaped for the benefit of the pathogen, not for the host. And they went, what, what, what? Is, how can it be good for the species? And I got across after about 20 minutes or so that it had nothing to do with the good of the species. It was for the you know, benefit of maximizing transmission of genes in the pathogen. And there was a sudden moment where the chair of microbiology said, oh, and instantly they all went out and followed his work and bought his book and the whole field of microbiology at University of Michigan was transformed from a, a pre-Darwinian view to a Paul Ewaldian view looking at how virulence is shaped by natural selection and for me it was a, a moment when I realized hey this is serious stuff and even if you don't know that much about another field some of these ideas you can bring to other people and they can run with them. So, so that was marvelous. Um, Paul um, spent most of his time at, at Amherst um, where he continued to develop his work in many areas, especially evolution of virulence and infectious disease. But his interests are extraordinarily broad. He's a very creative fellow, and he's also been thinking, again, for the same reasons as last week's week before guest. He was influenced by Bill Hamilton and Dick Alexander and this remarkable gang at Michigan that was talking about the fundamentals of evolutionary theory applied to behavior on all levels. And I think that's what that's why we had this nucleus of people who have all sprung from that particular source. Um, in 2002, he went to University of Louisville, leaving a wonderful position at Amherst, because he was invited to start a program in evolution and medicine, which he did. I think he now calls it the program in disease evolution, but this was probably the first program any place, really, in evolution and medicine. He also is editor of the journal Evolutionary Medicine, um, and today we're going to hear about what he has to say about evolution and the origins of cancer. Ready, Paul? Yep. Well, thank you, Randy. Also, I hadn't heard that before about your uh, uh, interaction there with the uh, microbiology department, and it's actually very nice to hear that that effect happened, that you, you made these comments and then it changed their view. It might be the only place in the country where that happened, at least for the <laughs> first 10 or 20 years. But it may have also been the way you explained it. Maybe I need to talk with you about how to present ideas a little bit more, and maybe I can actually have the same kind of an effect. Well, today I want to talk about um, cancer. And you can see from my title that I've um, used some fairly strong language towards a unified theory of oncogenesis. And I have a little bit of intrepidation when, you know, in, when I was making this decision to use this term unified theory. And um, originally I thought, well, of course, that's what we want to do. This is sort of in the grand tradition of, of evolutionary thinking. Um, but I think what happened is somewhere along the line, I got a little bit um, messed up. And I, I guess I would, or at least a little bit more cautious, and I think I would trace it to a, a think tank that uh, I was involved in at uh, National Cancer Institute. And, I, in the process of, you know, discussion with about 40 people or so, uh, we were talking about um, the role of evolution in cancer and talking about whether the National Cancer Institute should have a program. And I made the comment that I think we're at a point where we really couldn't make a unified theory. And there were people from all sorts of disciplines and <clears throat> there were physicists in the audience which were really important in getting NCI to think about evolution. And, and I looked at their faces and they were just shaking their heads and their faces were all gnarled up. And you know, the, some, one of them raised his hand and said, there is no way we're gonna have a unified theory of cancer. We're nowhere close. 
And, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, that kind of stops me short. And I, was, and, and I was sort of wondering what the problem was. And I, th I think the real problem is for physicists, a unified theory means something different than what it means for an evolutionary biologist. As an evolutionary biologist, I sort of think about, you know, Darwin's theory of evolution as a unifying uh, theory, a unified theory that tried to, and I think was successful at drawing together what was known about <coughs> scientific studies of living things into a theory that, that actually made sense of all that was known. And whether it was a good theory or not so successful theory was um, uh, clarified in the succeeding decades and now centuries um, in which um, it holds up to new evidence. And so that, that's sort of the model in which I am um, proposing that we really need to work toward a unified theory of oncogenesis or unified theory of uh, cancer. And um, I want to sort of suggest why I think now is probably the right time. We've gone through a few decades of very smart people uh, suggesting that <coughs> we're really around the corner towards uh, the goal of understanding cancer from a mechanistic point of view. And that understanding will eventually not only clarify what cancer is all about, but allow us to figure out how to deal with cancer, prevent it, and treat people. And one of the main figures uh, in uh, this area is Robert Weinberg, who uh, wrote a paper uh, just last year, which I think summarizes quite nicely um, the idea that cancer is kind of in a Kuhnian crisis right now that after all this work, all this really fantastic technology, all this uh, concerted effort of very bright minds on this problem, we would think that at this point, we would really have made some really great progress towards eliminating and treating cancer. So Weinberg, uh, really for 20, 30 years, has been saying, you know, we're really getting there. And then he wrote this paper in 2014. I'm just going to read a couple of quotes. We can read it together. A period 1980 to 2000 occurred when there was a flurry of molecular and genetic research that gave hope that cancer really could be understood through simple and logical reductionist thinking. Uh, this is all in sort of the concluding part of the uh, paper. Our current dilemma is that we cannot really assimilate and interpret most of the data that we accumulate. So this can be thought of as maybe a bioinformatic overload um, how will this all play out? Uh, it's a job for the next generation. <laughs> okay, so after all this time, saying we're on, right, on, right around the corner, right around the corner. Oh, this corner is a little bit um, further off than I thought. Um, and then he finally, finally said, passing the buck like this is an enormously liberating experience. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, you know, it, to me, this captures the sort of current state of crisis of people who really are bright people who um, had a certain approach that they thought was really going to solve the problem. And now they're saying, wow, we've really pushed this. And now it just, I don't know where to go. There's so much information, the kinds of simplifying uh, principles that we thought were going to guide us, did guide us to some extent, but now gu gu guided us to a place where we don't really see a great um, sort of synthetic conclusion occurring. And he's also uh, an interesting person to refer to because he, was and Douglas Hanahan were responsible for generating what I think most people think of as the, what's now the most useful conceptual framework for cancer. And if I'm going to be talking about a unified theory, I'm essentially going to be saying that these conceptual frameworks aren't enough, that we need something more. We really need a theory. And the framework didn't claim to be a theory. What it claimed to be was a way of thinking conceptually about a problem that was getting ever more complicated in terms of uh, identifying the major features of uh, oncogenesis. But from the point of view of an evolutionary biologist, I think we would identify that there are potential limitations that suggest that we need something a little more like a true theory than what was um, what the cancer researchers have been using, especially over the last decade, 15 years, <coughs> as a way of organizing their research. For one thing, it was really descriptive. They're getting all this information about cancer, and we're hoping, or the people that were really using this as a, as a conceptual framework, were hoping that out of all this information, the truth would emerge. And that's generally not how things have happened in the history of science. Generally, <clears throat> you get the information, you get alternative hypotheses, and then theories 
and you're continually trying to test those, but those are simplifications of a vastly greater um, body of knowledge, and certainly Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection fits that generalization. Another problem that we're beginning to see now is these major features or hallmarks of cancer are <coughs> uh, sort of difficult to identify. Some of their early um, hallmarks made a lot of sense, and now as we're learning more, we think, well, another feature of cancer, you know, involves interaction with the immune system or communication between a cell outside of the cancer cell and the cell that is a cancer cell. And so <coughs> we, it's sort of unclear what are the major hallmarks, where we draw the line between the major hallmarks and the minor things. And if we can't draw that line, we run the risk of having thousands of things being features of cancer. And so we're back to where <coughs> we started from, which is sort of an overload of different ideas. And so, and then as we, the evidence of that is that over the last 15 years since this hallmarks of cancer has been presented, we have had hallmark proliferation and we just don't know where that's going to end. So, you know, in the last few years we've been talking about various other aspects of cancer that should be included in, in, as hallmarks. But if we get this proliferation, then it's just not clear whether we're going to get what's truly uh, an encapsulated understanding that we'd like to get out of an overarching theory. There's also the stem cell theory, and that has its limitations. Um, <clears throat> I think, to me, one of the major concerns about the stem cell theory is it's really a theory based on metaphor rather than on first principles. So although the hallmarks of cancer was trying to say, let's get all this information and see how the, the, first princi the principles emerge, Stem cell theory was saying, well, we understand development pretty well. We understand there's stem cells that lead to uh, tissue development and organ development. <clears throat> so when we look at cancers, maybe it's the same kind of thing going on. And so maybe it's certain cells that have the potential to generate differentiated cells and other tumors if the uh, progeny of those uh, stem cells or stem-like cells replicate and spread through the body, maybe that's at the heart of cancer. And to some extent, you know, there's some support for that. But a lot of the cells really aren't stem cells. And so people have sort of rescued the theory by saying, well, they're stem-like cells. But at that point, it does become a little bit circular. Because one thing we know, one reason why people were focusing on stem cells is because they actually had the potential for unlimited um, uh, proliferation. And they had the potential to differentiate into different types of cells. And so, and since we know that any cell that's responsible for cancer is going to have those same characteristics, because we can't have the potential for undifferentiated, or uh, potential for unlimited proliferation, you're essentially not going to get cancer, right? So in a way, it's kind of working back on itself. People say, well, they look stem cell-like. Maybe they are stem cells, but they're not all stem cells. Well, so maybe they're stem-like cells. So we still have a theory, but, but um, the starting point is, almost, or the way the theory is developed almost has to be true based on what you know about how cells might proliferate and metastasize. So those uh, conceptual structures um, are not really meeting the need. And then we have, actually going back a little further, we have, I think, what most of us learned uh, when in early, at least those of us over maybe 35, 40 learned as the uh, reason why we get cancer, which we can sort of sum up as the multi-hit mutation model, which is the accumulation of mutations that eventually um, cause a cell to no longer have regulation and divide in an unlimited way and uh, then spread through the body as a result of the proper uh, or the, the troubling mutations that have occurred. But one of the problems there is as we got to uh, really look at this closely, we saw this tremendous number of mutations that were involved, even in a single cancer, you could have, um, with different individuals, mutations that had very little overlap. And so the idea of just looking at more and more mutations and expecting the truth to emerge really wasn't going to work very well. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Hanahan and Weinberg developed the hallmarks, because they realized mutation theory is not by itself enough. We really have to think conceptually of the major features. Um, the other problem, I think, with the mutational model is that um, it's really built on mutations, and now we know that there are a lot of other things that feed in on oncogenesis. And so, you know, now we know that epigenetics play a role, the microenvironment plays a role, and we know that infection plays a role as well. So these conceptual frameworks have, I think, probably uh, met or are meeting the end of their 
usefulness as a, as a unified theory, as a, as a comprehensive theory, they can still be useful in certain aspects of the problem of oncogenesis. So the question is, how do you actually go about generating something more useful and broad, and hopefully something that's accurate at the same time? You know, we don't want to be generating theories that are kind of off in the ozone. And so I would argue that the, the unified theory of cancer and oncogenesis has to be an evolutionary theory. For, for three main reasons. One is that the process of oncogenesis is an evolutionary process. You've got normal cells evolving into something different. You've got them evolving into cancer cells. And, I, and it's through selection, right? There's, there are mutations occurring. Nobody's arguing about that. And those mutations are, are allowing different cells to uh, be better at replication and, and maybe survival. Uh, some people call this natural selection. I don't think this is really right. The selection that's going on is fundamentally different from natural selection because natural selection occurs over generations. So you can get this refinement and you get selection for regulation of cellular activities for the benefit of the organism, or we could say if we're looking at it um, in terms of sort of modern genetic theory for the um, enhancement of uh, allelic propagation over time. But with regard to what's happening in oncogenesis is we have a finite time for almost all cancers, that you've got cells evolving into cancerous cells and then the individual dies either because of cancer or for some other reason, and then it all has to start over. So that's one fundamental difference in the action of selection. It's not between organisms, it's, it's or selection within organisms. And that selection, because of that, is generally selecting for very different kinds of characteristics. It's like selecting for a dysregulation of cellular activity. When you have selection on multicellular organisms or an organism in general, you're selecting uh, for uh, cells that are often restricting their own activities uh, in ways that allow for the successful reproduction of the organism. So for multicellular organisms, you're having <laughs> cells that are not replicating more. They're often replicating in very controlled ways so that uh, the organism is surviving and reducing, reproducing better, even if it involves the cells killing themselves in the case of, let's say, infected cells that are protecting the organism. So, so I think it's better to think of this as oncogenic selection to distinguish this from natural selection. I think Darwin would agree, because Darwin is distinguishing artificial selection from natural selection, sexual selection from natural selection. Oncogenic selection is even more different from natural selection than I think sexual selection or artificial selection are because it's not selection of <coughs> organisms over time which leads to this regulation and this refinement of characteristics. It's really leading to not a refinement of characteristics but sort of every cell for itself kind of action. Um, the other reason why we have to think of building a unified theory on evolution is that we now understand that organisms evolve defenses against cancer through natural selection. And this is all becoming clarified um, every year now as we're recognizing that long-lived organisms, large organisms, are um, having uh, additional defenses against cancer being incorporated into their biology um, so that you don't have large uh, long-lived organisms dying uh, during embryonic development or during uh, juvenile stages. And then the third reason, which is becoming increasingly important, is that a lot of cancers involve interactions between parasites and the host, which um, then lead to cancer in the host. And so we ne really need to understand the evolution of parasite characteristics that compromise the defenses against cancer that have evolved in the hosts. And so really I'm going to start to try to link all these things together. And what I hope to do is indicate how when we bring these together into a more unified uh, approach to cancer, which I think is pretty much all-inclusive of the current state of knowledge, then that will point direction as to uh, what we need to do to further understand uh, not only what oncogenesis is, but how to interfere with it and how to treat cancer. Okay, so what I want to do first is modify that central uh, process here, center of my list, that in which uh, evolution is important. And this is sort of the beginning of the generation of this hopefully more general, all-inclusive, unified uh, theory of cancer. Uh, 
And so I want to categorize organismal defenses according to uh, two categories. And the goal here is to try to get at what are the key features of cancer, the things that, that are going to be really important to understand well if we're going to under, not only understand cancer but figure out how to prevent and, and even cure cancer, from what is the big part of this information overload. It's all these details that are emerging that um, uh, arise when we were trying to figure out how cancer cells are different from normal cells. <clears throat> so I wanted to make two categories. One category I want to refer to as a barrier to cancer, and I'm defining barriers as a process that blocks oncogenesis. Okay, so in other words, if that barrier is in place, you will not get cancer. And I want to distinguish that from something that I'll refer to as a restraint on cancer. And a restraint is just something that may retard the development or the aggressiveness of the cancer, but it isn't uh, something that, if it's in place, will prohibit the occurrence of the cancer. And the reason I want to do this um, is that uh, I want to focus on the parts of cancer which are the parts that, if we keep them in place, the process we keep them in place will prevent cancer, because that's what we want to do, prevent cancer. Or if we're trying to figure out how to deal with cancer, we want to figure out how to reimpose a barrier against cancer. Okay, so we have to be thinking about this distinction. <clears throat> and I think um, the other reason for thinking about this distinction is there aren't very many barriers, but there are tremendous numbers of restraints. And there are even more numbers greater numbers of changes that aren't really very relevant to the process of oncogenesis. So in a way, what I'm trying to do is simplify the approach. I mean, this is, we were just following after Darwin on this. Darwin wanted to simplify things to the, the, the key um, issue that's involved, and then um, hopefully we can actually deal with this avalanche of information. More than 200 papers a day, scientific papers are published on cancer. Right? So there's just an unlimited amount. And as we start to expand our perspective to looking at microenvironmental effects, things like that, epigenetic effects, there's going to be even vastly more changes that occur. Okay? So we have to have something that simplifies but in a direction that gives us insight into the, the key feature of the process and allows us to kind of say, well, a lot of this other stuff may be noise or if it's not noise, it's just something that could be distracting us from the central issue. Okay, so. One of the reasons we want to distinguish barriers from restraints is that we want to be able to identify essential causes of cancer, distinguish them from exacerbating uh, causes and side effects. It's just another way of uh, saying with categories what I was just saying a little bit more verbosely a, a minute ago. So what we want to do is define essential causes as those factors that compromise barriers to cancer. Because if the barriers are in place, you won't get cancer. So things that compromise the barriers are the things that we can think of as these essential causes of barriers. So if we're thinking in terms of mutations, we'd be saying these are the critical driver mutations. People like to talk about driver and passenger mutations to, to sort out uh, which of these mutations you really want to focus on. Now we can define exacerbating causes as those factors that compromise restraints. So uh, on the previous slide, I had written that uh, a barrier to cancer would be cell cycle arrest. Let's just go back that for a second. Uh, cell cycle arrest. If the cell is not dividing, you're not going to get cancer, right? Very simple. So that's a barrier to cancer. A restraint on cancer is sort of the extent of proliferation of a cell. So if a cell's proliferating slowly, you can still get cancer. If the cell's proliferating more rapidly, you're going to be more likely to get cancer. So there's not a barrier there, but there's a restraint. So if you're going to be focusing on threat detected, nah. Oh, I see you don't see that. I have here the threat uh, detected. No, that, nah, this ASU won't have that kind of problem, I'm sure. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't allow this, this uh, presentation to just collapse, implode on itself. Right? Yeah, right. Good. I'm glad to have that, that uh, support alleviating my concerns. OK. So uh, the, because the restraints are going to be far more common if you uh, compromise a restraint, you're going to be exacerbating the problem, but you're not going to be preventing the problem. And then we got all these different uh, changes that may be just side effects. So if we're looking at mutations, you've got a few critical driver mutations. 
some other driver mutations that are going to be exacerbating the problem, actually many more of those than those, and then even more what we would call passenger mutations that are just mutations that are occurring because you've got high mutation rates in cancer cells, and they're not going to be uh, necessarily relevant to the progression of cancer. There's just going to be things that have happened, and they may be carried along as a result of mutations that are actually selected for uh, during in this uh, context of high mutation rate. <coughs> Okay, so I've already talked about cell cycle arrest as a barrier to cancer. I would say there, there are really only four key barriers to cancer. This is why this is, I think, a simplifying conceptual framework. So cell cycle arrest is clearly a barrier. Apoptosis, or cell suicide, I consider another barrier. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, typically if cells recognizes the, recognize their, pro their problem with the cell, this, there will be cell signals that tell the cell to kill itself. And if, um, the cell kills itself, that cell is not going to be progressing to cancer. So what we're seeing are categories that reflect survival and reproduction. Um, cell cycle arrest is something that affects reproduction of the cells. If they're not reproducing, you don't get cancer. Apoptosis, something that reflects the survival of cells. If the cell can kill itself, if that apoptotic mechanism is still in place and, and, um, and uh, functioning, then you're not going to get uh, cancer if that if cell can kill itself. Um, another one is regulation of telomerase, uh, a cancer defense that probably protects most of us to a large extent is that cells have a built-in ability to restrict the total number of cell divisions that will occur in the future. And that's a result of the shortening of the telomeres every time the cell divides and the lack of the enzyme that adds those telomeres back on in other species uh, so that the cell, those cells in those species can divide forever. But for large multicellular organisms like us, that is a real danger if any of our cells could divide forever. So we actually have the gene for telomerase, but we keep it under wraps so that uh, cells are restricted, most cells are restricted to have only a certain number of cell divisions. So if you are, have a cell starting to divide because um, you've got a mutation that has relax relaxed cell cycle arrest, then you could potentially have a problem with cancer, but it divides for, you know, 10 times, 10 cycles of cell division, and that's it. Okay, so I would say it's pretty safe to conclude that that regulation of telomerase is, is something that occurs in large, larger lung or organisms uh, because it's actually a barrier to cancer. And then another barrier to cancer, if we define cancer as a metastatic tumor, um, metastatic invasive tumor, is cell adhesion. If the cells are adhering to each other, they're not going to be um, uh, wandering around the body in a metastatic way. And so regulation of telomerase would cap the total number of cell divisions. Again, it's capping reproduction, so it's influencing the reproductive side of of selection, zero survival and reproduction, reproductive side of cellular fitness, if you want to call it that way. And then cell adhesion is <coughs> um, restricting the ability of the cell to move in different parts of the body to where there are more, you could think of more resources so that the um, <coughs> reproduction could be higher. So again, we're coming back, since it's an evolutionary framework, to the simple idea of survival and reproduction, which is the heart of um, selective uh, concepts. Okay, so what I want to do is now shift to this last um, category because I think a lot of insights can be generated by thinking about barriers and restraints and the way in which barriers and restraints can be compromised if we bring parasites into the picture. Again, the idea of a unified theory is bringing all of the insights from the various lines of inquiry together and what we know now is we cannot leave out interactions between parasites and hosts. <clears throat> And one of the reasons we can't is we now have the record that tells us that parasites play a big role in uh, development of cancer. And most of this is coming from human cancer because we studied it so intensively. But there's similar data from uh, veterinary cancer where we can run experiments. Much less information from cancer in nature, mainly because we just haven't studied it very well. So this is sort of a timeline of acceptance of infectious causation of cancer. Um, and, you know, prior to 1970, there was really no good evidence. And around 1970, there was this big fight going on between people who were suggesting that infections could cause cancer based on animal models in which infections really did cause cancer, and then people saying it was just genetic changes. 
And that was often very vitriolic, and people were unkind to each other <laughs> in their discussion when um, uh, Peyton Rouse, who was the person who uh, published the first really good evidence that an infectious agent could cause cancer, in this case in chickens, he accepted the Nobel, he, he published that in 1910, and then they finally got around to giving the Nobel Prize in about 65, I think. Um, when he had his, uh, we gave his Nobel Prize presentation, he was saying this should put an end to this nonsense that um, changes in genes have anything to do with cancer, okay? So that kind of got people upset, and they said, well, we're going to test that, we're going to, we're going to study that. There was also a lot of people who were interested in the possibility of infectious causation of cancer at that time because, you know, here was evidence that infections could cause cancer. So there's a, a large battle that was going on between these different camps, sort of the genetic camp, the infection camp, that was uh, beginning to really get ahead of steam in the 1970s, particularly when Nixon started putting a lot of money out into uh, research on cancer through the war on cancer. And uh, what came out of the genetic side was oncogenes and tumor repressors in the late 70s. And what came out of the infectious side in the 70s was not much, okay? We, people had recognized that wormy type parasites could contribute to cancer, but you know, that was a problem that didn't seem at all relevant to cancer in you know, places where the money was being spent, like the United States. Um, and then there was this other weird cancer that occurred largely in tropical areas where you had Plasmodium falciparum, and there was an emerging sense by about the mid-70s that a human virus and the malaria parasite somehow interacted together to bring about this cancer of B cells, which is referred to as Burkitt's lymphoma. It's now referred to as endemic Burkitt's lymphoma. So up through the 70s, I could say, okay, so now we've got some evidence, some human cancers, or at least influenced by infection, if we want to define infection broadly to include multicellular parasites. Um, but that could pr pretty much be swept under the rug for most people. And that all started to change in the 80s after the money was pretty much removed from uh, the war on cancer program. And after kind of the, the oncogene people sort of won the day. Um, in fact, Weinberg uh, w wrote to Gallo, who was studying this retrovirus as a possible cause of human cancer, in around 1979, 78, saying, you're wasting your time on this. Weinberg had actually started on infectious cause of cancer and then looked at the data on oncogenes and then participated in the discovery of oncogenes and tumor repressor uh, genes and then became a convert and then became sort of anti-infection. So he was complaining to Gallo, you know, you're, you're being a fool. And then Gallo and Japanese researchers um, in around 1980, uh, really published evidence suggests that uh, leukemia uh, and, well, leukemia and a lymphoma could be both caused by this virus, human T lymphotrophic virus, HTLV-1. But that wasn't very important in, you know, Europe or the U.S., and so that was kind of swept under the rug, too. It was important in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Japan and Southeast Asia. But then all this, you can begin to see we've got this change. I'm not going to go through all of these cancers. You had time to sort of per peruse them. Um, <clears throat> but what we've got is steady progress towards 2015 in recognition that infectious agents are playing a role, an important role in causing cancer. And I would just pause for a second and say that, you know, we sometimes think of the germ theory as something that was introduced in the late 1900s and that was good. We understand certain infectious causes of disease and pretty much that was where the, the extent of the germ theory. But if you actually look with an open mind at the history of medicine, you see the germ theory has always been making progress, but what's happened from the 18, late 1800s to the present is the recognition of infectious causes of disease it has involved diseases that are caused by infection, but ever more cryptically. So now the heyday of the germ theories involve, involves chronic diseases <clears throat> that, that have been um, instigated by infections that may have occurred decades earlier. and in the beginning have been associated with very few or no symptoms. So these are really difficult to um, link together, the, the infection and the chronic disease. And if there's variation in this crypticness of infectious causation, then we can expect exactly the pattern that's occurred, which is it's going to be very prolonged. Every decade people think now we understand the, the um, <clears throat> spectrum of infectious diseases. And everything else is going to be chronic diseases resulting from, you know, genetic predispositions and non-infectious environmental influences. And that view has been steadily eroded every decade, and now it's being eroded <coughs> largely in the realm of chronic diseases. And really, I would say the hottest area of the disease 
the germ theory today is in cancer, but there are some other very important areas as well. Okay, but the, the main point here is if we just look across those human cancers on the left, if we look at the pathogens in the center, we see that it's not just one pathogen, different pathogens playing a role. A lot of viruses been playing a role, and um, <clears throat> this is not slowing down. It looks like there's been a steady kind of accumulation of information. We could say now that we understand that 20% of human cancer is uh, involved to, to one way or another with infectious causation. We say now we understand it, but that's the same kind of generalization that was made throughout the last hundred years and every time it's been wrong. That we've, we, every time we look more carefully, we see that we've only understood a certain portion of the uh, whole spectrum of infectious causation. If this had all occurred in the 80s and then there was nothing um, from 1980 on, then I think you'd have a little more um, strength to the argument, a little more justification for concluding uh, that maybe it was just a, a, a little blip in our, um, our, have I really talked for 50 minutes? So I think you have about. You must have set this wrong. 10, 10 more. Okay, well, 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 I think 10 would should probably be okay. And if not, I won't ask you again until I finish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're such a nice guy, you won't bother me on that. Okay, so I think there's good reason for thinking that we really need to address infectious causation more carefully. And it has always been, ever since the, the, the people who are advocating mutational um, influences on genetics won the day in the late 70s, it's always been sort of a poor sister. It hasn't been funded very well. Um, but if we look at this more closely, we may be able to understand whether or not there are reasons for suspecting that a lot more cancers may be caused by infection. That's what I want to do the rest of the time. Okay, so the, the first thing I want to address is <clears throat> why infectious agents, and particularly viruses, seem to be associated with cancers. Because cancers aren't going to benefit the virus, right? So I think we have to think of it from the pathogen's point of view. And what I mean by that is we have to think about what the viruses benefit from in this whole process of oncogenesis. So the, when we're talking about it from the host point of view, we're talking about viruses that are compromising barriers to cancer. When we talk about it from the virus's point of view, the viruses are evolving characteristics that allow themselves to persist inside of hosts. And so one really important way in which a virus persists inside of hosts is by infecting the host cells instead of producing virion particles that are released from the cell, triggering those cells to start dividing so they're hidden from the immune system. So they don't have to expose as many antigens to the immune system. And so uh, we can look at the barriers to cancer that I've talked about in terms of barriers to persistence from the virus's point of view. Okay, so this is from the host's point of view when we're focusing on cancer. From the virus's point of view when we're focusing on persistence. Again, we're talking about issues of survival and reproduction. If their cell is under cell cycle arrest, then <clears throat> that barrier to cancer is a barrier to viral proliferation because if the cell starts dividing, the viruses can replicate every time the cell replicates. If the virus doesn't cause the cell to replicate because most cells don't last for very long, the virus's future is pretty much doomed. And certainly in terms of competition uh, among different viruses, the viruses that are able to replicate more uh, by triggering their host cells to divide are going to be in a better competitive situation inside of the host. And of course, for the virus's point of view, we want to be thinking about how increased viral propagation inside the host leads to transmission. The more viruses that are around, the greater the chance of transmission per contact it's susceptible. Apoptosis is also very damning for uh, viral persistence because if the cell recognizes that um, it's infected or it has genetic damage and kills itself, then the viruses that are in it are not surviving anymore. Okay, so again, we're talking about survival and reproduction. Regulation of telomerase is very important to interfere with for a virus because if the cell is going to only divide 10 more times, then that limits the total number of viral genomes that can be uh, generated. If the virus could alter that regulation of telomerase, then it could have unlimited proliferation inside of the host cell. And then similarly, cell adhesion, if it's compromised, then the virus has a chance to move around the cell, move around the body and replicate more. So again, from virus's point of view, we're talking about you know, viral fitness, we're talking about survival and reproduction of uh, the viruses. So that's all sort of a conceptual argument. The question is, what's really going on? When um, people first found, start finding that parasites could contribute to cancer, they kind of took the path of least resistance. They said, well, we know that cancer uh, arises as a result of mutations. And so when we get the infections that are contributing to cancer, the, 
maybe they're just altering mutation rate. And so we can sort of summarize that argument by the red arrows here. So we've got infections leading to processes like inflammation, production of reactive compounds, which then could cause mutation. And those mutations could then lead to oncogenesis as they accumulate, and the mutations block those or compromise those barriers to cancer. And also, inflammation could lead to proliferative responses, which could make the cell a little more vulnerable to going uh, through the process of oncogenesis to full-blown cancer, which is essentially a proliferative disease. The alternative explanation, based on the argument I was just making, is that maybe those viruses are evolving to actually precisely compromise those barriers to cancer because those are barriers to persistence. So that is a very different kind of argument. This is the argument that people have pretty much accepted during the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s and some even into the 2000s, some even into 2015 as the major action by which, major process by which infection uh, promotes cancer. This alternative is something that is really focused much more on natural selection acting on the viruses. And um, we can evaluate that now. We know the molecular details. We can find out, do pathogens, and particularly viruses, for which this argument is particularly applicable, do these viruses actually directly abrogate, directly, directly compromise, particularly the barriers to cancer, to actually instigate and promote cancer? And so, you know, this is pretty complicated. I think Randall's only going to give me about 20 more minutes, and so um, <laughs> I want to come th go through this fairly quickly, but let me just give you a couple examples. So Epstein-Barr virus has been associated with nasopharyngeal cancer and is accepted as a cause of nasopharyngeal cancer, post-transplant proliferative disease in Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma now, about in 2015. It's been associated. It's still sort of at that point at which, um, you know, there's not widespread acceptance. Um, and it's also been associated with breast cancer, but whether it's causal, people are arguing about. Okay, but if we look at the actual molecular mechanisms, we can pinpoint the genes and the proteins that are uh, generated by those uh, genes that are responsible for, uh, in, or that may be responsible for um, altering these different barriers. We can ask, are, is there anything that's known about uh, the uh, viral biology supportive of the idea that uh, uh, the cell cycle arrest is compromised by the viral infection. So for Epstein-Barr, we know there's the EBNA3C gene, which is Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen uh, type C, 3C gene that inhibits and degrades uh, the retinoblastoma protein. Retinoblastoma protein is the protein that, that enforces cell cycle arrest. So you degrade that, you release the cell from cell cycle arrest. Um, and also, it encodes uh, uh, BRAFO protein that ups HER2 and HER2 signaling, which is, uh, can influence a breakout of cell cycle arrest and also proliferative rate. So in this case, it could influence both um, the uh, barrier and the restraint. Um, and then LMP2, which is a latent membrane protein, too, ups a uh, cellular protein called RAS, which can have uh, pro-proliferative uh, effects. Okay, and, and we can just look at, for every one of the viruses that's been studied sufficiently to assess whether at the molecular level the virus is actually sabotaging a barrier, whether uh, uh, that actually holds up or whether the evidence says no, it, it may just be uh, mutation. So LMP1, related to LMP2, LMP1 induces TERD expression and telomerase activation. So that, that ameliorates the regulation of telomerase, which allows the cell to produce telomerase and to uh, have unlimited number of divisions in the future. So there again, the barrier is compromised. Um, we could, here are the, the various uh, viruses that we have sufficient information for. And all I've done now is just say, yes, that barrier is compromised. Yes, that barrier is compromised specifically by an Epstein-Barr virus protein. We want to look at apoptosis. We want to look at cell adhesion. Um, and the true the answer is yes for everything, okay? Every one of these viruses compromises every one of these barriers, okay? And it's known at, at the molecular level how those barriers are compromised. So, um, and I could add one more to this, which has been studied, I think, sufficiently well, um, and that's Merkel cell uh, polyoma virus, uh, which causes Merkel cell cancer. So, it looks like natural selection shapes these viruses to compromise the barriers to cancer, 
which from the virus's point of view allows them to persist, which then um, supports this idea. Now, it doesn't say that this idea is not playing a role, but if you think about it, I think it's very clear that if you've got evidence that indicates this is playing a role, it's probably the major player because what it means is when you get that first virus infecting that first cell, you simultaneously compromise four barriers. If the role was going to be infection increases, you know, mutation rates, you're going to have to get a whole lot of divisions occurring, a whole lot of mutations, and a, and a lot of luck that mutations that are going to keep the cell from dividing well aren't going to occur before you get the mutations in the genes that encode for the barriers. So this is likely to be a much less important um, part of the process than this is because this happens all at once. You're compromising all of those barriers as a result of the way that the viruses has, have evolved. Um, so again, if this is an inclusive theory, a unified theory, we, we have to deal with some of these other developments of, uh, that have been um, involved in this complicated and confusing picture of cancer. And one of the developments is that, as I said before, that the microenvironment seems to play a role. And if we thought about how many mutations there are that could uh, be occurring in cancer, if we think about all the microenvironmental effects, we instantly generate tremendous potential complexity. And so, to me, in my mind, the way to think about this is to bring into cancer research one of the ideas that was brought into research in ecology and evolution to address the same kind of problem. If you're talking about um, what is, how do we understand um, variation among individuals in a population in the context of um, variations in fitness of which competitors will win and what the outcome of that select uh, competition would be. We can't just think about the phenotype of the individual. We have to think about what Dawkins was referring to as the extended phenotype. We have to think about the characteristics that any given allele in that individual would influence, not just in the biology organism, but the way the organism interacts with nature. So caterpillar cocoons, you know, the, the silk is not part of the organism anymore, but it's part of the extended phenotype. Bird's nest are part of the extended phenotype of a bird. Spears that hominids use are part of the extended phenotype of the hominids. And so if we think about it in terms of cancer, we can say there are going to be tremendous numbers of <coughs> environmental, microenvironmental um, effects of genetic changes in a cell. And those genetic changes could be as a result of mutations or it could be a result of introduction of genes into the cells because a virus has entered a cell. But regardless, if we're looking at the, the phenotype of those changes, it will include the microenvironmental changes around that cell. And so we can, just like we can in nature, we can say, well, there's so much, this is overwhelming, we can say, what are the critical things? You know, a bird's nest is really critical to understand the success of a bird. You know, different species will have different bird nests in different environments depending on, you know, what's available and what kinds of protection the nests are providing. Uh, similarly, we really probably couldn't understand human evolution very well without thinking about the weapons that humans are able to, to use. And so I think the same kind of argument occurs for um, uh, the understanding the variation in the microenvironments. And I think this is important because there are some people now that are saying, no, the microenvironment could cause cancer all by itself. This theory says now, I don't think we want to go there unless we have really good evidence. This suggests that natural selection is going to mold the genetic makeup of cells to be resistant to cancer. And probably you're going to have to have altered genes in those cells to cause cancer. They could, again, be genes introduced because of infection or genes because they're present because of, um, of uh, mutation. Um, and so for cancer cells, angiogenesis, the production of, of blood vessels around a cancer that's depleting nutrients is part of the extended phenotype. Leukocyte invasion of the tumor is part of the extended uh, phenotype. Um, and if we're thinking about the genes and viruses that could be introduced into cells and thereby contributing to the extended phenotype of the viruses, um, those uh, extended phenotype uh, characteristics I talked about earlier um, would be included, uh, but also breaking cell cycle rest, all these barriers would be included as the extended phenotype of the viral genes. Um, and again, for, I think for the reasons that I was talking about. So the last thing I want to mention, and I'll try to do it very quickly, is if we're th thinking about viruses as playing, or any pathogens as playing an important role in cancer, and we're trying to think about in terms of barriers, we're saying that those viruses uh, because they compromise all those barriers at once, they're sort of packets of essential causes, right? 
if you, if you had a mutation that, that eliminated cell cycle rest, that would be an essential cause of cancer. But a virus will do that, and it simultaneously it'll alter those other barriers. So it's really a packet of essential causes. So it's very important for us to understand which viruses would be under selective pressure to um, be persistent and thereby under strong selective pressure to compromise the barriers to cancer, to have those uh, packets of essential causes. So basically we want to ask what kinds of transmission, since transmission seems to be the critical variable that influences viral characteristic, characteristics, what aspects of transmission would be especially likely to say, uh, favor um, persistence. And unfortunately for us, maybe more unfortunately for younger people than old people like me, um, is that it's sex and kissing. And I mean very intimate kissing where, you know, saliva gets exchanged, not just the perk on the, che on the cheek. Um, and the reason why is kind of simple. That selection for persistence is going to be associated with opportunities for transmission that are few or far between. If a person has one sexual partner and they break up with that sexual partner, have another one two years later, the only viruses that are going to be able to be transmitted to the new uh, partner are going to be the persistent ones. Okay? Same thing for really intimate kissing. We don't, you know, intimate kissing partners are sort of separated usually pretty widely in space and time. Not for everybody, but for, um, you know, most of us, I think, in this room, I suspect. Um, because I think we're all in a profession of, an academic profession rather than other professions. Um, but there are also some other modes of transmission that would fit these criteria. One is milkborne, but I put these in lower case because I think, you know, we can look at viruses of humans, and not very many are milkborne. HTLV1 is, by the way, and so is um, hepatitis B, but they're also transmitted by sex. Um, a needleborne transmission is another one that's a little more fuzzy, but generally probably transmission opportunities are fewer and far between than, let's say, transmission of a respiratory tract pathogen, like common cold virus that I could, you know, uh, transmit to all of you if I had one within an hour. Okay, so one way of assessing, is this really on the right track or not, is to look at all the cancers that we've now accepted as being caused by infection and ask what percentage of them, what percentage of the pathogens that cause them are um, transmitted by sex, intimate sex, or I say it's always intimate, sorry, uh, sex, I think, sex or intimate kissing. And I've highlighted the ones that are transmitted by sexual contact in red, the ones that are transmitted by kissing in pink, and uh, some of them are transmitted by both I've made in pink and red. But the main thing here is not to sort of go through all these, but just to say, is the graph mostly pink or red? Mm -hmm. And about 20, 25 percent of all human pathogens transmitted by kissing or sex. This is, you know, getting more in the range of 90, 95 percent. Okay, so this supports the idea that of the cancers that we now accept as being caused by infection, they're tending to be caused by infections transmitted by kissing by sex. And we've also got, you know, a little bit of milk born, as I said, here, a little bit of milk born here, and also a little transfusion here but not respiratory tract transmission, for example. What about the pathogens that have been linked to uh, cancers but are not accepted as causing cancer? And this acceptance often takes decades. So sometimes linked pathogens turn out to not, not to be playing a causal role. Sometimes they do. So what I've done here is use the same color coding, um, but um, I put in purple those for which, those pathogens for which we don't understand transmission. This is a little bit concerning because viruses like VK virus are in the polyoma virus group, and that's a group that is known to be cancer causing, and they're infecting 70, 80 percent of us in this room right now, and we don't even know how they're transmitted. So that's a little bit concerning. It says we really should be emphasizing uh, learning how those viruses are transmitted because they're popping up in these cancers. But there again, because things are, that are either turquoise or pink or um, red are um, uh, mostly, turqu or mostly pink or red, again suggests that in the future we're probably in store for recognizing sexual transmission, kissing transmission is primarily um, uh, important. By the way, bovine leukemia virus, yeah, this is one that's transmitted by milk, so it actually fits the idea even though it's not transmitted by kissing by sex, transmitted in cows, but it's not transmitted from person to person as far as we know. Okay, so what are the take-home lessons? As is the case so much in medicine, if, if you're changing the way in which we're viewing a problem, there can be all sorts of uh, implications across uh, human activities. So one is obviously 
an implication for research, suggests we should be looking more closely at infectious causation, recognizing that the future examples of infectious causation of cancer are likely to be involving infections that are causing cancer more cryptically, and they're going to be harder to identify. We can talk about some reasons why that would be the case. But I wanted to come back to uh, Weinberg's uh, quote here. Uh, he emphasized that what had been done until recently was using simple and logical reductionist thinking, which makes sense, um, but also may have limitations. And the dilemma was that we can't assimilate and interpret most of the data. And what this allows us to say is, well, there's going to be a ton of data there, just like there is in nature if you're trying to study something in nature. You've got to think, what are the most important things to look at? And what are the things we can sort of push to the side because they're likely to be less important? That's where this idea of essential causation, exacerbating causation comes in. And the arguments, I think, that I've suggested is we probably have been always underestimating the importance of infectious causation, so we should study much more uh, the possibility that there are infectious agents we haven't even linked to certain cancers that could be causing the cancer. Um, we do have only four minutes before we have to leave. Four minutes. I'll be done in one minute. Good. Okay. People have questions. Okay, good. We'll get them to them. Um, so Randy and I go a long way back. We can kid each other a little bit on this. I know he's not kidding, but I'm sort of kidding. All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> okay. I love to talk to myself. It's just, it really is, um, uh, quite, um, it doesn't lead to a lot of controversy. Okay, all right, so business models, if you're running an insurance company, if you were to um, suggest that more people get uh, uh, certain vaccines, you can protect those people, give them breaks on their insurance, you're probably gonna be protecting them not only against the cancers that we recognize now, but the cancers that will become associated with certain pathogens in the future. So, you know, we've got a lot of pathogens like HPV that are associated with cancers, and maybe you're gonna protect against some of them as well. Um, public policy, clinical practice, you know, we can make guidelines as to the extent to which we should be educating people about infections and the extent to which we should be educating physicians about the importance of, you know, certain vaccines now and possibly in the future. And then finally, personal empowerment. Last point I wanna make um, is that uh, just this knowledge gives you a sense of how you might be able to prevent cancer. Since a lot of these pathogens transmitted by sex and by kissing, young people especially, uh, when you're making decisions about, you know, is, you know, this person cute enough or not cute enough? Oh, what's the harm? You can remember the lecture and say, oh, there's potential out of harm. I may want to protect myself against cancer. I may not want to have that additional partner. And uh, who knows? It may actually save your life in the long run. All right, so I'll end there and open this floor for questions. Thanks. I'm curious in your perspective, do you think it will be that we find an infectious cause for most cancers or that we'll be able to divide cancers into those with an infectious cause and those with an alternative yeah. cause? Yeah. I think we'll be able to divide them. I think there'll be some that probably don't have infectious causes. I think the ones that don't are the ones that involve cells that are already have a lot of these barriers compromised. Mm -hmm. So, well, melanoma, melanoma, I'm not so sure. Melanoma, but remember, all, all these infectious caused cancers are also going to involve mutations as well. So we're always going to involve environmental influences as well. So melanoma, we know UV light is contributing, but we haven't really looked closely enough to see what other kinds of, uh, you know, infections may be. So I, I would say, I don't know what to say on that one, but, you know, for something like um, a retinoblastoma, that would be one. If I had to pick a cancer that, that is very likely not to involve infection, I would choose that one for a variety of reasons. You know, the cells are already sort of partway there number of other epidemiological reasons. Uh, but even that one hasn't really been looked at very well. There's one paper that suggests that viruses could be involved. Um, uh, but I would say for the vast majority, we, we really should look at this scientifically, think, you know, getting studies that, that carefully sort out the possible role of infection. And right now, that's about, you know, 75.8% of cancers are in that zone where we just really have to look. Yeah. Last question. Um, <clears throat> so, how you call the evolution of normal cells into cancer cells through oncogenic selection? I mean, this is not the transition from a single cell from a normal cell status into a cancer cell status because that's more development, right? That's plasticity in a cell which transfer from one state to the other. I mean, I have a yeah. hard time oh. seeing how evolution, as I understand yeah. it, right, yeah. kind of 
I mean, yeah. why you call it evolution? Or no, no, I, I think it is an evolutionary process. And uh, the non-genetic changes, because it's a genetic change. Well, first of all, it is an evolution of phenotype. But I think, it's well, some of it's, it's no, no, but some of it's uh, phenotypic plasticity. I don't think there's any cancer that's yet been shown to be a result solely of phenotypic plasticity with the same gen genotype. I don't think there's any one of them. So if there is, then I would say, oh, this unified theory isn't quite unified enough. Some people have argued that microenvironmental effects would be sufficient, but I don't think there's any, any compelling evidence that would say that you can get cancer without a genetic change. The genetic change could be, again, genes coming in from a pathogen so or a mutation. Genetic mutation evolution yes. in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I call it oncogenic selection, okay. because I want to distinguish it from natural selection, which involves selection over generations of organisms. This is selection over generations of cells that end when the organism dies, from almost all cancers. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, sure.